Thank you, sir, for granting us this interview. Uh, can you state your name and your profession? My name is Louis Surly, and I'm a writer. Wonderful. Uh, sir, coming from a family of three generations of West, Bank, uh, West Point graduates, uh, how did you influence, how it influenced you and shaped your interest in, in military uh, history and your decision to serve your country? I basically went into the family business. Uh, I was very proud of my grandfather, whose name I have, and of my father. And uh, so I wanted to be like them. And I don't remember a time when that was not my ambition. The earliest time I can remember, I wanted to go to West Point like them. I wanted to be an officer. And uh, that turned out to be a good thing for me. I enjoyed my service. I was proud of serving my country. I was um, happy that my father and my grandfather were proud of me. And my grandfather lived to be 99 years of age. So uh, I knew him. Uh, for a long time after I was a grown-up, which was nice because we could talk about his service and mine, and uh, that that worked out very well. I uh, was born at West Point. My father was teaching there at the time, and then of course I went there as a cadet. Later I went back on the faculty. Um, later I went back and researched a book that West Point asked me to write on the history of the honor code, and. Uh, Someday I'll be planted there, I hope, near my father. <laughs> so that's that's sort of that, my background story there. Wonderful. Uh, so, uh, was you in Vietnam during your service? Yes. Um, when I went to Vietnam, uh, I was a, a fairly new major. Um, the system then was for people to go for one-year tours. So I went in the summer of 1966 and stayed a year. Initially, I was assigned uh, to a city named Nha Trang, where we had a, a headquarters called First Field Force. And I was what's called a G3 planner. And I stayed there about four months. And then I went uh, up into the highlands in the area around Pleiku where I was uh, what's called executive officer, that's the second in command of a tank battalion, and I spent the rest of my year there. A very, interest, very interesting time for me. Uh, because of my planning duties in the first part of that, uh, the Trang is in what they call the second core tactical zone, uh, which include the highlands and the, and the coastal zone. But I also got to see the uh, First Corps area uh, in the northern part of South Vietnam and briefly the Third Corps area, which includes Saigon. Later on a trip back there uh, for temporary duty, I got to see the Fourth Corps down in the Delta. So I have at least a, uh, you know, a, a very general impression of the whole country and the different parts and how they differed from one another. Um, I, I would like to say that I came to love Vietnam as, as a place and, as, and knowing some of the people. The people we mostly knew were Montagnards, um, several different tribes in the areas around Pleiku and then up toward the border. Um, very interesting people. To, to Americans, they seemed a lot like what we think the best of the American Indians must have been like very self-sufficient, uh, very hardy, uh, proud, independent, uh, good people. We admired them. And um, Vietnam was and still is, I'm sure, to an American's eyes, a very exotic country. Uh, I can remember flying in helicopters and seeing elephants and once a tiger. Well, this was very, <laughs> this was very exciting to me. So my, uh, my feelings and memories of Vietnam are mixed. Uh, uh, very sad for the way the war ended and very sad for the people I knew there who suffered and are still suffering. But um, also very admiring of the, what the country was like and what the people I knew were like. And uh, I still hope for a very bright future for Vietnam as time progresses.
So I let go back at that time. When you get there and you spend some time in there, what do you think about the war? Uh, do you have any, uh, you recall, you have any idea where the war will go to? We're going to win now. You see difficult, right, uh, you know, at that time. That's a good question because uh, in, in, the, in the assignments I had, you know, I'm a major, so I'm working at middle level at best. Every day, uh, we're fully occupied with the mission that we're trying to accomplish. And, and we thought we were doing a good job. And in fact, we were accomplishing the mission that we had been asked to accomplish. And so we thought, naively, hey, we're winning the war. Um, only later, when I became a scholar of the war instead of a low-level participant, did I realize that the approach General Westmoreland was uh, um, backing and directing uh, was not an effective one, and we can talk about why, but basically it was because it was involved entirely with trying to kill as many enemy as possible and ignoring the real war, which was in the hamlets and villages of rural Vietnam, South Vietnam. So, you know, we went home very optimistic. We thought we'd made a good contribution and, it, and, and then later on we realized uh, that had been a, an ineffective approach to the conduct of the war. We'll talk about this, I know, but then um, a year later General Abrams takes command, has a wholly different understanding of the nature of the war and what needs to be done to prosecute it effectively, and then we have what I refer to in the book title that you know about, uh, what I call a better war. And so we'll talk about that, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, so as Abram realized, uh, the tactic of um, uh, Westmoreland, uh, General Westmoreland, that are not right for Vietnam. But uh, Abram, he had uh, his time from 1967 until very much the war ended. Uh, so how, how the war turned out for at the time from Abram to his end, uh, can you uh, recall? Sure. Yes. That's a great story, actually. Uh, it's a very positive story. Uh, we wasted all that was achieved there by our later political decisions. But in the meantime, a lot of good had been done. It's hard to uh, cover this very briefly, but I'll make it as concise as I can. Uh, General Westmoreland, and, uh, William C. Westmoreland, and General Creighton Abrams were exact contemporaries. They were the same age. They were West Point classmates, class of 1936. Uh, Westmoreland came up through the artillery, Abrams through the armor branch. They were different in almost every respect, um, including the most important respects. General Abrams was a man of absolute and total integrity. You could trust him, you could believe him. General Westmoreland was self-serving and uh, didn't mind uh, uh, shaping the record to, to, to make himself look good. General Westmoreland went out to Vietnam in January of 1964 as deputy to the American that was then a senior American there. We have to remember now these Americans are only in command of American forces. They're not in command of it. So I don't want to ever sound like I think they were in charge of the whole war. The Vietnamese were in charge of the whole war. But they were very dependent on us for the wherewithal to prosecute the war. Just as the North Vietnamese were very dependent on the communists for their ability to prosecute the war. Uh, in June of 1964, General Harkins was recalled and General Westmoreland became the senior American, a position he held for four years, from about June of 1964 till June of 1968. Critically important time, and in my judgment, he was not up to the job. Uh, he had a very narrow view of what the war was all about. His approach to the conduct of the war was uh, uh, to conduct a war of attrition. What that meant was kill as many of the enemy as you can. In such a war, the measure of merit is body count. Rack up a big body count and you're winning the war. That was his view. 
And uh, to achieve that, or try to achieve that, he used what were called search and destroy tactics, which did succeed in killing a lot of the enemy, no doubt about that. Unfortunately, they also had spillover that caused great harm to the South Vietnamese that we were supposed to be helping, especially the rural, in the rural areas. What General Westmoreland claimed to have achieved uh, never happened because the North Vietnamese proved willing and able to simply replace the large numbers of casualties that he inflicted on them. And so after four years of this, uh, we were no farther along than we had been at the start. We're fighting different people, but the North Vietnamese proved willing to accept horrifying casualties and still keep on, keep on with their aggression against the South. In May of 1967, while still in command, General Abrams is sent out as his deputy. Difficult for them both. They're such different people as I told you. There's no chemistry, no human sympathy between the two of them. General Abrams is basically uh, cut out of um, major decisions about the conduct of the war. He spends that year that he winds up waiting trying to help the South Vietnamese improve their capabilities and does some good for them. For example, General Westmoreland had never been willing to give the South Vietnamese the modern weaponry that the American forces were equipped with such things as the M16 rifle and so on. So during the Westmoreland years, the poor South Vietnamese are left to fight with basically cast off World War II vintage American equipment, like the M1 rifle, which is almost as tall as the average Viet Vietnamese and heavy to lug around. Meanwhile, the Americans have the modern, highly capable M16. Worse yet, the enemy has modern equipment such as the great AK-47 assault rifle provided to them by the Chinese or the Soviets so that the South Vietnamese are outgunned and, uh, and it, it tells that they're not as successful as they would like to have been. They don't enjoy the reputation that they should and their morale suffers. So Abrams gets busy on this. And, and he starts getting them some M16 rifles, for example. By the time of the Tet Offensive in the end of January 1968, some of the elite forces have that weaponry. The Rangers, some of the Rangers, and some of the Airborne uh, have that. But not until General Abrams succeeds to the top command does everybody get it, which makes a huge difference. General Westmoreland had come back to the United States three times during 1967 and he talked to various audiences. This was an unheard of thing for a field commander in charge of a major military effort to come back to the United States and, and sort of, you know, make the case for what he was achieving or claimed to be achieving. Among other places, he talks to a joint session of Congress and he talks at the National Press Club in Washington. And he says things like, uh, I have never been in more encouraged during my nearly four years in Vietnam. And things like, we've reached the point where the end begins to come into view. And things like, the enemy's hopes are bankrupt. And when only a few weeks after that, the Tet Offensive bursts out all over South Vietnam, and Americans see that on their television sets, they reach one of two conclusions. Either General Westmoreland didn't know what he was talking about, or he wasn't telling us the truth. And either one is a devastating conclusion. Soon after Tet 1968, it is announced that General Westmoreland will be uh, coming home and that his deputy, General Abrams, will take command. Now we begin the era of a better war. Before he went out to Vietnam, General Abrams had for three years been the Deputy Chief of Staff of the United States Army. And in that position, he had the major responsibility for building up the increased forces that we sent to Vietnam. They were sent there in response to repeated requests from General Westmoreland. 
whose response to almost any problem was to ask for more troops. And for a long time he got them in succeeding increments. The high water mark uh, was 543,400, well over half a million troops. After General Abrams took command, he never asked for a single additional soldier. What he did say was, I think we can make better use of the troops we have. While he was vice chief of staff and responsible for this big buildup, the chief of staff, who was a general named Harold K. Johnson, an admirable man, and he and Abrams were a very good team, had conducted a study about the conduct of the war in Vietnam. That study was called PROVEN for short, P-R-O-V-N. And what that stands for is Program for the Pacification and Long-Term Development of Vietnam. And that study said, in effect, what General Westmoreland is doing is not working, and it cannot work, because it's ignoring the war in the villages where the covert enemy infrastructure is using terror and coercion to keep the rural populace under enemy domination. And these big sweeps of the search and destroy, out, usually out in the deep jungle, you know, uh, uh, near the borders with Laos and Cambodia, having no effect on the war in the villages. And Proven said, we must never lose sight of where the real focus of effort should be in this war, and that is in the villages. So when Abrams becomes commander, he begins to implement the recommendations of the Proven study. General Fred Wyand, who was another senior officer there and had seen the war under Westmoreland and now under Abrams, said the tactics changed within 15 minutes of Abrams taking command. And they changed from search and destroy to what was called clear and hold, because in the earlier uh, period, after you cleared an area, if you just left there and went on somewhere else, naturally the enemy came back in and naturally took retribution against any of the indigenous people there who had helped the Allied forces. So now it's clear and hold, and the hold, this is very important, the hold is provided primarily by what were called territorial forces of the South Vietnamese, regional forces, which came under uh, province direction and popular forces, which came under district direction. And these were greatly expanded, given upgraded weaponry and equipment, and given intensified training. And they were able, in most cases, to provide the hold in clear and hold. So real progress was being made. Uh, Westmoreland and, and two key associates, uh, uh, Westmoreland's idea was, as I said, to focus on the, the War of the Big Battalions with a focus on body count. Now Abrams and two key associates, Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, who served six years there in, in head of our embassy there, which by the way during the war became the biggest American embassy anywhere in the world, and Ambassador William Colby, who under Abrams had primary responsibility for support for the pacification program. So those three men, some of the finest public servants I think we've ever had, agreed that it had to be one war. Yes, combat operations, but much change, and upgrading the South Vietnamese armed forces, and rooting out this communist infrastructure so that we could pacify the, the hamlets and villages. And they set about doing that um, with consider considerable effect, even though during these later years, we're now talking, let's say, uh, late spring, early summer of 1968 until 72, when General Abrams went home. The American forces are being progressively reduced, just as in the early period they were progressively increased over and over again. What this means is, during the latter years, more and more it's the South Vietnamese who are taking on more and more responsibility for the conduct of the war, and who are increasing in size, 
up to, at the peak, 1.1 billion people under arms, and who, by the way, are doing quite well. They're doing quite well. And it's so, so much so that the counter guerrilla war, if you want to call it that way, the counterinsurgency war, was clearly won well before 1972. And um, I know I'm going on quite long here, but if, if, if I can just continue this answer a little bit more, we then get up to uh, what's called the Easter Offensive in the spring of 1972. Clearly the Communists uh, realize that they have been defeated in the counterinsurgency war, and, and so they uh, decide to switch to a, a large-scale conventional attack on the South, which has three prongs, one across the demilitarized zone, one through the Central Highlands, and one just from the west of Saigon, launched more or less simultaneously with the equivalent of 20 divisions. When the Americans invaded Normandy in World War II, there were five divisions in that invasion. This is 20 divisions, 14 divisions plus the equivalent in separate regiments and others of six more to make point. By then, almost all the American ground forces had gone home. All General Abrams has to help the South Vietnamese is air power and naval gunfire. And he uses that uh, uh, brilliantly. Initially, there are significant reverses, especially uh, in the north across the DMZ. They send um, a new commander to the I Corps region, um, General Truman, thought by Abrams to be South Vietnam's finest soldier. He stiffens the he stiffens the defenses. Uh, and then he throws the enemy back, and, and such losses are inflicted on the invading North Vietnamese that it's three years before they can mount another comparable offensive. And by then, lots of things that we'll talk about had changed. After this great victory for the South Vietnamese, the anti-war elements uh, said, well, they couldn't have done that without American air power. And General Abram said, there's no doubt that American air power was extraordinarily important, but if the South Vietnam, if the South Vietnamese had not stood and fought valiantly, 10 times the air wouldn't have stopped the enemy attack. He would not listen to anything that was critical of the South Vietnamese, who he thought had fought valiantly, and indeed they had. So that's the big difference between the earlier period and the later period. Difference in understanding the nature of the war. Difference in uh, deciding how to prosecute that war. And difference between the big buildup of American forces in the earlier years, the Westmoreland years, and the progressive withdrawal of those forces in the latter years. And those latter years, which I have referred to, as you know, as a better war, are quite, quite inspiring to me in terms of, of the Americans, yes, but, but especially the South Vietnamese, because as I said, more and more it becomes their responsibility to conduct the war, and they do so very well. So by saying that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the strategy of uh, uh, General Abrams South familiar with Modern Museum the first president of South Vietnam, which he would like to have eight form American, uh, but not much of the troop, and he can very much deal with the war, and uh, he would assassinate it. Uh, he would uh, assassinate not because American, we all know that, but with the help of American, with the coup d'etat. Uh, you can see any similar between Abram and Moody Zeal, a uh, way of dealing with the war. That's an interesting question. I don't think I'm really very well qualified to answer it. My uh, scholarly interest in the war uh, probably dates primarily from 1964 when General Westmoreland goes out there. Um, my friend Mark Moyer, 
has recently published a, a very long, detailed, and scholarly book in which he talks at great length about President Xi'an and the um, events that led to his uh, being overthrown and then assassinated. And I think that's a, that's a, a very good resource, but I can't myself validate all those things. Here's what I do think about the American collusion in the overthrow of President Xi'an. Uh, there's an old saying that the first rule of wing walking, you know what wing walkers are? They're, they're acrobatic people in the old days when they had open cockpit biplanes and these guys would walk across the wing for air shows. Daredevils. And, and so the first rule of wing walking is don't turn loose of what you got hold of until you have hold of something else. And then you could go like this, right? Well, uh, don't get rid of President Xi'an unless you're assured that you have uh, some better, something better to replace him with. And as, of course, as we all know, there was not only nothing better to replace him with, but a bunch of clowns who had no idea uh, how to govern, much less how to prosecute the war. And so we went through one, one tabulation I've seen says nine different governments in the course of the next uh, two or three years. Finally, we get some stability with President Tu and uh, Vice President Ki. And, and you know, uh, uh, President Tu stays almost until the end. So I would say that was a huge mistake on the part of the Americans. If they felt it was necessary to replace President Museum, then the prudent thing to do would have been to find some able successor or successors and help those, that person become better prepared and equipped to take over and have not just a program of dispossessing the person in charge, but what are you going to do now? You're in charge. So the war effort went downhill badly in the year or two after President Siam was was deposed, and that led to the a very desperate situation which led to the introduction of large numbers of American ground forces. So, um, who knows what the outcome might have been had they either stayed with President Xi'an and assisted him more, or if they felt he needed to be replaced find some capable person to do that and help that person be ready to do it. But, um, you know, those are imponderables. We'll never know what might, what might have been. My, my very good friend, now, now deceased, Stephen Ambrose, an historian, uh, said something um, on the military channel once that I thought was very good. He said, uh, nothing in life is inevitable. That is my strongest conclusion as an historian. People make choices, and choices have consequences. And there's a great example of it. That, I don't know much more about the Xi'an years. I'm sorry. So that's, I think, that's the most uh, sophisticated in, uh, they're talking about, you know, the battle up back um, and they said that that's a great loss for Americans, but I heard from other point of view saying that no, even the first time they, you know, face to face together, but you know, they, uh, the other side lost, uh, both sides lost something, but the other side really lost the war. That battle, what is your opinion? I think the Battle of Abbaq was a puny little battle that had no influence except the journalists who were there built it up into something that it really wasn't a determinant of, of the later course of the war. I, I would dismiss it as inconsequential. So uh, they compare Kaesang with Dien Bien Phu. Can you elaborate it? Was it? What is your opinion? That's an interesting question. Dien Bien Phu and Kaesang. You know the works of Bernard Falls, I'm sure. And you know it's probably his book held in a very small place about Dien Bien Phu, uh, which is well done in my, in my judgment. 
seems clear to me that the uh, French did not lose their war to reimpose their domination over South Vietnam at Dien Bien Phu. They lost it in metropolitan France because people there, as a consequence of Dien Bien Phu and other things, lost confidence and lost willingness to continue to prosecute the war. So this is a very interesting thing when we get to Quezon. Quezon, as you know, is up in the far northwest corner of, of Vietnam with, near the border with Laos. Very remote. Um, and General Westmoreland was focused on Quezon. And even after uh, the Tet Offensive broke out all over South Vietnam, he continued to believe that that was a diversion because the real battle was going to be at Quezon. And, and as a consequence, um, he had moved a lot of forces up into the I Corps area, the area of northern provinces of South Vietnam, and, and stripped them from other places where they could have been come in very handy had they not been redeployed like that. And it was quite some time before uh, uh, General Westmoreland could be persuaded that, wait a minute, Quezon's only a diversion, that's the diversion, and the real war is, you know, where we see it taking place all across the country. Later he said, I think this was in, in an interview, he was asked, what, was, what decision are you proudest of during your command in Vietnam? And his response was the decision to hold Quezon, which I find laughable and very revealing of his shallow understanding of the nature of the war. During the, uh, the Tet Offensive, our president then, as you know, was Lyndon Johnson. And he was very, very worried about Quezon and the potential loss of it. So much so that in the Situation Room in the White House, he had a little terrain model of Quezon and he would go and look at it every day. I have seen that model. It's now in the Lyndon Johnson Library in Austin. You can go and look at it if you wish. And, and that just shows how, how concerned he was about it. Quezon was of no importance, except that we chose to put a bunch of embattled Marines there who lived like rats in a cellar for several months. After, uh, after, the, Easter, after the Tet Offensive was over, and it's been announced that General Westmoreland will be going home and General Abrams will succeed him. General Westmoreland does go home for some purpose, uh, for temporarily, before he gets over command. And while he's gone, his deputy, General Abrams, begins to make plans for withdrawing from Quezon. Westmoreland comes back and he's horrified by this and he cancels all those plans because he doesn't want, uh, he doesn't want it on his watch Quezon to be abandoned. As soon as General Westmoreland leaves for good and General Abrams is in command, his chief of staff at MACV, a general named Dutch Kerwin, uh, is called on the intercom and it's General Abrams. And the first thing he says is, Dutch, what about Quezon? They get out. And that's the end of that, because it was of no it was of no significance other than uh, if the enemy had overrun it, that would have been a serious loss, more in terms of uh, international uh, reputation and propaganda, probably than in terms of the military forces that were there. If if Quezon had been overrun by the enemy, I don't think the uh, effects would have been equivalent to Dien Bien Phu's having been overrun. I don't think that would have precipitated our abandonment of the effort in the same way it precipitated the French abandonment of their effort. That came later for different, a combination of reasons. So what about the battle of Hue, take offensive, uh, the communists broke the C5 and attacked uh, over 100 cities of South Vietnam and the uh, whole way for 26 days. Uh, do you uh, have any comment on that? Yes, that's also a very interesting question and there are a lot of different ways to approach that. 
I'll take one, uh, one approach. You know that the communists called that offensive, which we call it Tet Offensive. They called it General Offensive slash General Uprising. And, and it appears, even now, with all the material from the North that we have read since then, it appears that they really thought that when they mounted this offensive, large numbers of South Vietnamese were going to rise up and support that offensive. And that the result was going to be that the uh, Allied forces, the Americans and others who were there assisting the South Vietnamese, were going to be forced to withdraw. Not militarily forced, but politically forced to withdraw. So they mount this offensive, as you said, almost simultaneously in, in most important parts of South Vietnam. I think 36 of the 42 or so um, provincial capitals were attacked, for example large numbers of district towns and most military, um, most major military uh, installations too. And uh, the fighting is over in a matter of, let's say two or three days, in almost all places, only in Saigon, where it lasted for about a week, and in Hue, which you observe, where it lasted for about a month, did, did the offensive continue. And um, the communists took very heavy losses, but no general uprising. And, and they, they seem to have had uh, no, what would we say, no follow-on plans come in behind the general offensive that we know about. No major reinforcements to come in any place. No escape routes for anybody who was found that they were weak, too weak to accomplish their mission. And so, it looks like what they were relying on was this general uprising of the public to make those initial attacks valid. So that didn't, that didn't happen. Uh, so, uh, very serious fighting in Saigon, and um, General Abrams is very unhappy with the use of heavy firepower in and around the populace there, and when he becomes commander a few months later, a few weeks later really, one of the first orders he issues is there'll be no use of heavy firepower in populated areas without my personal approval. No more heavy artillery, no more air power, unless I say so, where the people are. And uh, the fighting in Hue is very, is very desperate. But uh, when they finally retake the Citadel, the first Harvard Infantry Division, commanded by Major General Truman, takes it, and they put the South Vietnamese flag up there. And General Truman told me later, the first message I got was from General Abrams congratulating me, which told me that he was following our efforts very closely, and he was very proud. He was very proud of that, and they were always very close from then on. And I've described earlier. General Truman's key role in throwing back the Easter Offensive four years, four years later. So, um, at least I would have thought as a soldier looking at this, that the communist leadership would have looked at the results of that effort and decided that maybe they should take another approach. But they didn't. They tried major offensives like that again in uh, late spring. We refer to that as mini tech. Again in September, we refer to that as the third offensive. And guess what? Again at Tet 69, four times they tried the same thing. Four times they suffered grievous losses. And the last three times, General Abrams has come in, and believe me, he is on top of that. The intelligence is better, the preparations for repelling these attacks are better. And, and the attack, the, the, the losses to the enemy suffers are grievous.
And only then do they finally figure out this doesn't seem to be working, we better try something else. And in the, in the summer of 69, they issue which something called Cosman Resolution 9. And it says, in effect, we better go back to a protracted war. And they broke down some of the large units into smaller units, and they backfilled some of the local uh, uh, Viet Cong forces that had been decimated with, in, with uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, and, and so on. And then they continued in that vein until basically Easter of 72, four years later, when having lost the counterinsurgency war, as I've described, they thought, again, we better try something different. Only now they think, hey, the Americans have gone home. Basically, this is going to be, I won't say easy, but this is going to be a lot, a lot easier. And once again, I mean, this is hard to believe, but the literature, including what we've gotten from archives in the North, seem to tell us this. Once again, they expect a general uprising of the populace in support of them. And once again, of course, the South Vietnamese are not having any, any, any part of that. And so, once again, after some very fierce fighting, uh, they are defeated in the ways we described. Interesting. So, um, I need to ask you this question. And um, uh, in that battle, we, they uh, kill many uh, civilians. But they uh, repeatedly deny that Chen Men Cha, General Chen Men Cha, was in charge of that war, and uh, he on uh, public television, American public television interview, he said, uh, yeah, like you said, his goal would destroy enemy, uh, uh, have the uprising, and then uh, set up a government for Hue, and they intend to use it like a capital of, yes. of uh, yes. You know, Sabi now at that time. Right. And then uh, he said that they, they fell in in all three, only the last one, and they occupied for 26 days. And he repeatedly denied that um, they didn't kill any civilian. The, those civilian, mm -hmm. somebody referred to mm -hmm. 3,000, mm -hmm. 3, somebody 5,000. Yeah. It died because American killed them, or South Vietnamese. Sure. Uh, uh, kill them or they die because of the, you know, of the bullet, the war, the, and right. going off. What is your comment about it? Uh, no serious person can deny that the communists came in with targeted lists of people that they were going to find and murder. 3,000 is the number that most people think um, is the minimum number. Mass graves were discovered in which these people were found. Many of them with hands bound behind their backs, shot through the head, clearly executed. Uh, many people saw the murder gangs going through the streets searching for people that were on their lists. In one of my books, I have a photograph of a large number of caskets prepared for Buddhist funeral and burial. Um, what's interesting to me is not that the communists continue to deny this. That's what communists do, is lie. What's interesting to me is that this story got very little press coverage, even in the West. Uh, whereas, uh, some disgraceful episodes, such as the Mi massacre, carried out by some American soldiers, got huge amounts of press coverage. I don't have any trouble with that. They should have. But why wasn't the Hui massacre covered in, in similar way? Well, you can reach your own conclusions about that. But whether or not that massacre occurred, I think is beyond question. Perhaps anybody that wants to know can know, yes, it, it did happen in the way that we just discussed. It's interesting, too, that uh, this was uh, just a, a, a sort of writ large example of the way the communists fought the war in general. Not only were they uh, not careful to avoid civilian casualties, 
they had a, a, it was an important part of their conduct of the war to cause civilian casualties in every way they could, including sending children on bicycles with bombs into schoolyards to kill a bunch of children. General Abrams talked about this once in one of his staff meetings, and it's, he, he's, he just shook his head and said, it's very difficult for me to understand how anyone could think that that advanced the cause of either side in a war such as this. And, and yet the communists uh, uh, did that over and over again. The disparity then in civilian casualties between North and South during the long years of this war is, is enormous. First of all, there was no ground fighting in the North. Uh, and the bombing that we conducted there was carefully carefully planned to minimize civilian casualties. And even the North Vietnamese concede that. According to Douglas Pike, who was a scholar of the war and an American Foreign Service officer who served a number of years in Saigon, the, the South Vietnamese civilian killed during the war was well over 400,000. This is in a population of maybe 16 million, 18 million, 400,000, 465,000. And the, the Vietnamese civilian wounded approached a million. Much of that was delivered on the part of the enemy. What a miserable way to wage war. So, um you wrote several books, uh, one book uh, in particular earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, your point of view is very much different than most of the books that are on the market. I read, I read about mm -hmm. 60 some books so far mm -hmm. about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you only have 14,000 left to go. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and they say that that's a war that most documented, you know. Mm -hmm compared with any war in the history, American history. How in the world that, you know, they miss the truth mm -hmm. about a war? How, mm -hmm. What happened to the war? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, one part of the answer, I think, uh, has to be that some of the best known books about the war that came out fairly early on, basically end at Tet 68. Um, Stanley Carnow's book, Vietnam and History, ha has, um, let's say, three quarters devoted to Tet of 68, up to the Tet of 68, and only a quarter after that. The worst one is Neil Sheehan's book, A Bright Shining Light supposed to be a story about John Paul Van, which he uses as his motive to talk about the war as he sees it. This is a book of eight or nine hundred pages, and, and all but sixty pages are up to Tet of 1968. Sixty pages the rest of, of the war, even though John Paul Van, who he's supposedly right about, lives and fights and works four more years in Vietnam and reaches his peak of prominence. All that's dismissed in 60 pages. Why is that? Well, um, we can't say for sure what's in somebody else's mind, but what it looks like to me is Sheehan had a particular point of view on the war, which was based entirely on the war in the Westmoreland years. When there was certainly plenty to criticize, as we've already discussed, and as I say in my Westmoreland biography and also in A Better War, plenty to criticize, but people like Carnell and Sheehan, who are very well known, and Sheehan got a Pulitzer Prize for that book, and therefore they influence a lot of other people and their outlook, act as though the war under Westmoreland was the whole war and, the, and our approach to it was homogeneous throughout. As we've already discussed, it was radically different under General Abrams, along with Ambassador Bunker and Ambassador Colby, plus which we're drawing down our forces, as we talked about, and so it's more and more of the South Vietnamese War. And by the way, they're doing quite well. And that's a story, I guess, that's not congenial 
to people who early on established themselves in the anti-war camp and uh, took it as their mission to criticize everything about the war and those who were fighting it, especially South, the South Vietnamese. There were some other, other commentators, now those are books, but, but the, the daily press was also very important. You know the name probably Walter Cronkite. Cronkite was a very uh, um, prominent American reporter, journalist, and uh, he made a journey out to Vietnam uh, during the Tet Offensive, and he stayed quite a while. And he went up into the northern provinces where General Abrams was at a temporary headquarters up there. And then he came down to Saigon and he talked to General Westmoreland. And General Westmoreland said, you should go over to Second Field Force, which was in, I think, Benoit, and talk to General Fred Wyand, who was the Field Force commander of Three Star. Because he redeployed some of his forces in anticipation of the Tet Offensive. And they were able to do some real good to help the South Vietnamese and to inflict a lot of casualties on the North on the invading forces. So Cronkite goes over there and he talks to General Bland for an hour and a half on camera. And at the end, and General Bland has written this and he has stated it in an oral history that I conducted with him for the Army, and he has stated it in a public speech that he made at the Association of the United States Army. Cronkite said to him, well, General, that's all very interesting, but I'm probably not going to use any of it. Uh, I've decided this war is wrong, and I'm going to do everything I can to bring it to an end. So he doesn't go back and report the true story. He goes back and reports his skewed version of the story. Later on, Cronkite published an, publishes an autobiography in which he says, well, if you're a journalist and you want to be uh, respected and, and paid attention to, you've got to, to show no bias about the stories you report. you just got to tell them like they are. Well, of course, he himself had been, been, been uh, 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 guilty of doing just the opposite. And then he goes on for seven more years as the war lasts and reports it from that perspective. So, uh, the major books of the earlier years are very influential. That's a part of, of why the story is skewed. Important elements of the press who had a stake in the outcome of the war and not necessarily on our side. Some of the young reporters in the, in the uh, ZM era, it's clear developed a bias uh, uh, against ZM and in their reporting helped to bring him down. And then they had, uh, you know, they had a bias against uh, anything going, going better. Um, and the long period of time when things were not going well under General Westmoreland um, meant that the patience of the American public and important politicians and the media uh, basically was used up. I say in my biography of General Westmoreland that he basically squandered four years of support for the war from the American people and from the Congress and from even parts of the media. So all that went to the outcome you described. So any other element because I read out of book just like find a leg of Francis Frisera uh, she wrote about Ho Chi Minh, about Vietnam, like a uh, fairy tale. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, I don't know where she got it from, but it's really um, you know, what, uh, not a true. It, it, Vietnamese, yeah. we did laugh when we read all that. I understand that. I don't know where Francis Fitzgerald got the fairy tales either. Um, or where people like uh, uh, Jane Fonda got their outlook. Um, 
But I think a part of the answer uh, probably is that the communists were very effective in, in spinning a fairy tale about what liberators they were and about uh, how selfless and, and moral they were and portraying the patriots in South Vietnam in different terms than that. And, uh, and some of these people bought that hook, line, and sinker. And then once you've done that, if you're a public figure, it's really difficult to say later, oh my, I was wrong or I was duped because your whole reputation then goes down the drain. After the end in South Vietnam and all the terrible things that happened as a result, all the people who were incarcerated and some who were executed and others who fled, very few in the anti-war movement, especially in the United States, said, oh dear, uh, this is not what we had hoped for at all. We were wrong. Very few. One or two only that I know about. So they continue to try to make the same flawed case that led to the problems in the first place. But what their motivations were for that, I, you know, it's almost impossible for me to imagine. So you mentioned about anti-war anti-Vietnam War, uh, can you elaborate uh, in it, uh, how it formed, how the world is empowered to that? They can even, you know, make the government cannot keep a national promise to an ally of Vietnam. Another difficult question. Uh, part of the, part of the story probably is that uh, there were a number of people mostly younger people, but not, not all. Some were um, religious figures, some were political figures, who opposed the war, or more narrowly opposed their own involvement in the war. And so, if you didn't want to go to war, didn't want to be drafted, there were certain avenues that you could take to avoid being drafted. One was to stay in graduate school. One was to be a professor. There's a fairly large number of people who adopted that approach. First stayed in, stayed in a, a school, talking about college level school, graduate school, and then became professors to avoid the draft. And naturally, they then taught others an anti-war perspective on what was happening. And, and, uh, and so you had that element, and you had the element in the media that we've already talked about who had a, a vested interest in an anti-war approach. And those elements had a lot of control over the public dialogue, both in, on campuses and in the, in the media, in the press, and in books, and so on. But I would like to say this too. You have heard about the, uh, the, the calling of those who fought World War II the greatest generation of Americans, Tom Boca. Well, the great generation of World War II and I don't want to criticize them because my father and my uncle are both part of that generation, and I'm very proud of them. But two-thirds of those who fought World War II were drafted. Only one-third volunteered. Of Americans who served in Vietnam, two-thirds volunteered. Only one-third drafted. Just the opposite of the greatest generation. So the portrayal of the American Army in Vietnam is largely composed of unwilling drafted soldiers is, is, not, is not true, but most Americans even don't know that. So, um, a little bit more about anti-war because it's the, they did a lot to the war. Um, you just explain 
who they was and why they doing that. But can you tell about the uh, influence and the effect of the war, uh, uh, of them to the war um, at that time? How, how it formed opinion and how it made the government cannot do anything for war. I believe that uh, or the president, like Nixon, they, they, he wanted to keep the promise, but he couldn't oppose it. Can you yeah, let's talk about that because um, whatever one's views of Mr. Nixon, and there are plenty of things to criticize him for, I think he did try his dead level best to see that the war in Vietnam would have a good outcome and one which did not leave our allies abandoned as they wound up, as they turned out to be. Um, Mr. Nixon and his uh, most important advisor, Henry Kissinger, appeared to think before the fact that when he came into office, they would be able to negotiate uh, a settlement with the North, with the Communists, within about six months. And of course, that proved to be impossible. And I would now say, with the benefit of hindsight, predictably impossible, because negotiated settlements depend on give and take, some middle ground. And there's no middle ground there. The North's irreducible minimum demand was domination over the South. And the South's irreducible minimum demand was continued independence, no middle ground. So all the uh, backing and forthing about various negotiations and so on was all really ir irrelevant. And Mr. Nixon was a very smart man, especially in terms of international affairs and international politics. An example is his opening to China and, and how that played out. So after perceiving that no negotiated settlement was possible, his approach to the conduct of the war then was to begin to unilaterally withdraw American forces, thereby he felt diminishing the anti-war uh, sentiment that he had to deal with as president in the United States. At the same time, we built up the South Vietnamese so that they could, as we've already discussed, take on more of the responsibility, but be competent to do that because they had been increased in numbers. They had been given now, finally, the modern equipment to comp complement, I mean, to comp uh, comparable to what the enemy had and the training to go with it. So he was walking this knife edge always between the pace of withdrawal of American forces and the ability of the South Vietnamese to pick up more and more of the responsibility and pacification, pacifying the anti-war elements that, that were um, opposing him politically. I think he did pretty, pretty well with that. Within his own administration, there were forces that were in contention with one another. His Secretary of Defense was Melvin Laird. Laird always pushed for a faster withdrawal pace than Mr. Nixon was com comfortable with. Kissinger was in between those two, probably. However, uh, by the time the last forces came out, as we've discussed, about the time of the 72 Easter Offensive, with the help of American air power and naval gunfire, as we discussed. The South Vietnamese gave a very good account of themselves and, as I said, inflicted such casualties on the North that it was three more years before they could mount another comparable major offensive. And by then, of course, we had pulled a plug on our support for them. So, um, Mr. Nixon's battlefield decisions, I think, were appropriate and effective. But he was losing support politically in, in the United States, and primarily in the Congress. And there were elements of the Congress, mostly in the Democratic Party, but some 
serious defections from the president's own Republican Party too, who more and more uh, opposed the war, or at least opposed continuing American involvement in the war. And uh, they were able to pass a statute that said that as of, I believe the date was 15 August 1973, no funds could be used for American Armed Forces to any longer take part in combat operations anywhere in Southeast Asia. So now the South Vietnamese are entirely on their own except for the commitments the President has made to them to get them to agree with the Paris Accords that in January 73 theoretically were to bring an end to the fighting. Mr. Nixon promised President Q that if their fighting erupted again after the Paris Accords, he would reintroduce American combat elements to punish the North Vietnamese for those, for those violations. I think we're talking primarily about B-52 bombers here, not ground forces. That was promise one. Promise two, if renewed fighting occurred, the United States would replace for the South Vietnamese forces any losses of major combat systems. Those are things like tanks, artillery pieces, aircraft. And guess what? As was provided for in the Paris Accords. So even the Paris Accords contemplate the possible resumption of combat. That's, that's the second. Third thing promised, third of three, by President Nixon to President Chu was that the United States would continue robust financial support to South Vietnam for the foreseeable future. And when it came to the crunch, we defaulted on all three of those commitments. Now, in his memoirs, President Nixon says that the thing that undermined his ability to keep those promises was the Watergate scandal and his being driven from office by that. And Dr. Kissinger says the same thing in his memoirs. But the fact is, if you look at the legislative record, going back to that provision that said in August of 73, no more American ground forces, uh, no more American forces. The Congress had given up on the war well before Watergate. And, and without them, the South Vietnamese could not sustain themselves because, as we said earlier, neither North Vietnam nor South Vietnam had the ability to sustain their military efforts independently. They had to be sustained by, uh, by patron forces. The North Vietnamese, uh, rather adeptly in my view, played off the Russians against the Chinese and got considerable help from both. And as of the time of the final offensive, that was greatly increased support compared to what they had been given. Meanwhile, we had cut off virtually all support for the South Vietnamese. So basically, that's that. My friend Tom Polgar, who was the last CIA station chief in Saigon, sent a message near the end, maybe his final message, in which he said, final outcome no longer in doubt because the South Vietnamese cannot sustain themselves without our support so long as the communists continue to get robust support from their backers and sponsors. End of story. Uh, I am David, he in charge of supply um, equipment here, uh, itinerary to Vietnam. He wrote in an article called 12 Reasons for you know, for uh, Savina. Is this a, a Marine general? Yes, Marine. Great soldier. Yeah. Great soldier. Yeah. He said that there were 12 vessels. I've read, of, I've read that. Yeah. Can you make a comment about that? Yeah, it's that threat to South Vietnam. Yeah. I mean, that. General, uh, general Raymond Davis, nicknamed Razor Davis, came out to Vietnam to command one of the Marine divisions while Abrams is still the deputy. 
and 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 Abrams, like Westmoreland, is not all that happy with where the way the senior Marine leadership is handling things up in the northern part of the country. But he and Ray Davis really hit it off. And, and among other things, they agree that it's a dumb idea to have all these Marines hunkered down at Quezon where the enemy can pound them day and night. And it's a better idea to get them out of there and put them into mobile forces and have them move around and be much more effective in that respect. General Davis um, later became a four-star. Many people thought he should have become the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Instead, it was a General Cushman who had been a Marine aide to uh, Nixon when he was Vice President. And so many people thought that then, when he had the opportunity, Nixon promoted him up ahead of others better qualified. But, uh, but General Davis was one of the highly, highly regarded senior Marines, including by General Abrams, with, to whom he was very close. Uh, I've read that article. I can't remember all the 12 points now, but I remember thinking some of them were more important than others. And, and uh, we've discussed the most important ones, I think. Uh, so, um, I don't think we have much time, so I go into this um, short question, but probably you need to give me a very precise answer. Uh, sir, in your opinion, look like we win all the battles, but we lost the war. What happened? Well, I think we've basically discussed what happened. Uh, the South Vietnamese were defending themselves ably and effectively uh, until we no longer were willing to provide them the wherewithal needed to do that. While their uh, communist opponents were getting greatly increased support from their patrons, and as Tom Polgar said, that's the end of that. Okay, so, and then, um, what in your opinion, what need to have in order we have other outcome, better outcome? I think I need a short answer. Hmm. To have a better outcome, we would have needed to uh, develop and maintain the political support in the United States to enable us to continue to support the South Vietnamese. And we were continuing to support our allies in Europe and in Korea many years after those conflicts had uh, had uh, ceased to be armed, you know, active armed conflicts. And I see no difference here. The big failure uh, was the failure of our political leadership to develop and sustain the political support they needed to follow that course of action. Uh, so, um, Ho Chi Minh came back to uh, Vietnam like in 41. His the solely mission is to implement communism to Vietnam and later travel into China, three countries there. And uh, the fight with the good friends and communists were there since then, before Vietnamese, nationalist Vietnamese fought with France to try to get, gain independence from them. Uh, and later when Ho Chi Minh came back with his brutally, you know, act uh, as communism all about, people of the war of Vietnamese become friends and then Vietnamese, I'm sorry, and communists, Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. And uh, the war moving on later and then with American help and involved heavily, so on and so on. And then we see America, most of them don't know uh, that is the core of the, the fight of the Vietnamese because when uh, Ho Chi Minh took power 1954 brutally thing to the Vietnamese and that the people in Vietnam don't want that we don't want that kind of life but yet in America here they seem like they miss that totally they they thinking about they call us the American war um, you know, later people call Hanoi War. Um, how, how American public miss that? Yeah. You can find people much better qualified than I to talk about the politics 
of, of the war and its origins and the spread of communist domination in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Uh, but I will mention a, a new book by a, a, a Vietnamese uh, who is controversial but very interesting and well informed. It's called Vietnam Labyrinth and the author is Tran Mok Chau, C-H-A-U. And uh, this is a terrific book. I helped to get it published uh, by Texas Tech University Press. And uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. That would be a good source for someone interested in what you just asked me. Okay, uh, this is the last question. Uh, you have enormous uh, interview and material. I call mountain material. And that's how you come up with you know, very much uh, the truth for Vietnam, Vietnam War. Vietnamese people. Was it difficult to find the material you felt you, you had? Why is that order don't, I mean, fair to, to look at it before they yeah. write a book? Um, I've been working on these matters for about 30 years. Every day, almost, for 30 years. I've been thinking about these matters, talking to people about them, reading about them, writing about them. Um, there are a lot of uh, oral histories that are very good. The documentary record is huge. Uh, you mentioned uh, all the books you'd read. Uh, and neither you nor I is going to last long enough to read all the books there are. But there are a lot of, a lot of interesting ones. Uh, I also had very good fortune as a, as a researcher to be given exclusive access to tape recordings made in Charlie Abrams headquarters during the four years he was in command. About 2,000 hours of tapes. It took me a year to listen to those and make uh, detailed notes of them. And I published a book uh, uh, that uh, incorporates about half of the total material. Even then, the book's 450,000 pages long, uh, wor uh, words long, 450,000 words long. So that was absolutely authentic material that no one else had. That's very useful to me. Um, and as I've gone from one book to another, I've learned more. And, and fortunately, it's turned out that the things I had suggested in earlier books turned out to be accurate as further evidenced by what I had learned by the time of the next book and the book after that. So that was, that was lucky for me. Um, I want to say something about one last topic, if we just have another minute or two. And, and that has to do with, with the Vietnamese who have come to America. I have a number of friends in that category, and I'm very proud of them. Um, my oldest uh, and closest Vietnamese friend is a, a former colonel of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Uh, his name is Ha Mai Viet. And Viet and I were young captains together in the Armor Advanced School at Fort Knox in 1961 to 62. So we've been friends for a long time. Um, Viet was an honest, decent man and a good soldier. And he became the G3, the operations planner for General Truman at one point. And he became the province chief of, of Quang Nai where he was uh, beloved by the people for his honesty and his concern for their welfare. Viet is, to me, somewhat uh, symbolic of the Vietnamese who come to America. His family got out a few days before the end. He got out one day before the end, thanks to an other officer who had been in that course at Fort Knox with us. Found his family in, I think, Okinawa. And they made their way eventually to uh, Sugar Land, near Houston, not far from here. He's also the author of Blood and Steel. Yes, a book I helped him get published. He had written it first in uh, Vietnamese, self-published it, and then the, the Naval Institute Press published it as Blood and Steel. Uh, Steel and Blood, maybe. A very good book about armor in the war in Vietnam. I'm glad you know that book. Uh, Viet and his wife Hao have uh, five children, 
they put all th five of them through college themselves, Texas A&M and Sam Houston State. Viet and his wife worked two jobs, sometimes three jobs. Three jobs means a day job, a night job, and a weekend job. Now, they didn't do that all the time. They did it when they had to. And they got all these kids through school. They're all now professionals, uh, doing it very, very well. And, and they're, they might, Viet says, well, we're tired now, but they'll take care of us. Lots of other Vietnamese uh, that I know or know about have made good use of the opportunities they found here. I am very sad for them that they have uh, lost their own country. I'm very proud of them and the way they have um, adopted their, their new country. And many of them have made uh, considerable financial sacrifices to send money back to families, their family members that are still in, in Vietnam. And, and I would like to say that I think the expatriate Vietnamese, a million or so of them, many of them who literally risk losing their lives to escape and to come here, have been a great addition to America. And I'm, so I'm happy we have them. I'm very, very proud of them. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir. Good.